Pastor Jack Hibbs is under attack. And if that doesn't mean anything to you, it should, because what that means is that you are too. It's time to stand against evil. All right, folks, let's get into this one. This is uh, this is going to be something like we have not seen in a long time. And again, we should not be surprised by this. But what we are going to do is we are going to focus on how the government right now is making a concerted effort to attack Christians. The United States government, yes, there are many other governments all over the world that are doing this, but in America, this makes it particularly bad, and we'll start right now with what happened with Pastor Jack Hibbs. Now, I think it's very important to note this. Mike Johnson asked Pastor Jack to come out and to do a prayer to open up for Congress, So that's exactly what he did. He went to the U.S. House and he opened up in prayer. And I just want to say this. I'll make myself very, very clear here because I'm going to show you his prayer. Don't come and ask me as a pastor to do a prayer that fits around what you think I should say, especially when you have no acclamation to God or the things of God. Okay, if you're going to ask me to come and pray, then let me really pray. So this is what happens, and some of you may or may not know this, but when a chaplain is asked to come out and pray, they make you write down on a piece of paper exactly what you're going to say, and then they have to approve it. And they did that with Pastor Jack, and clearly what Pastor Jack read is not what they approved. So let's watch the video. We'll start with that. And then we're going to get into some things because there is a lot of material we're going to go over. And folks, I'm going to tell you this right now. This is going to be a very, very eye-opening video because we're going to show you some things that probably all of you know in one way or another. In some cases, you may not know. But when we put it together as a whole, this should open up our eyes because there's a lot of stuff going on here, folks. And this is really, really important. So let's start off with this prayer. Uh, that Jack shared in Congress. And folks, let me tell you, it is extraordinary. Let's start off with that. The House will be in order. The prayer will be offered by the guest chaplain, Pastor Jack Hibbs, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, Chino, California. Let's pray. I'm so proud of him. Almighty God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I'm going to let the prayer go through all the way through, but I just want to say, like the very moment I heard him start that way, I'm like, that is not what they approved. (laughs) Because Jack already dropped a bomb. I'm so proud to know this guy, to be his friend, to love him, to be a brother in the ministry with him, to serve with him. Man, what a blessing. I'm so proud of Jack. <laughs> it's just so awesome. Anyway, I'm sorry. I can't contain my... Every time I watch the prayer, I get giddy. I'm like... <laughs> it's just, uh, he literally, in the first few seconds, said everything they didn't want him to say. Oh, man. It's just... It's just... <laughs> I love Jack. This is great. Okay, sorry. A little bit of a raw reaction, but uh, I, I I just love him. Well, it's just great. What, what a tremendous boldness. You folks over at Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills... You are so blessed to have a pastor like him. What a blessing. Uh, I love serving with a guy that just fights like literal hell. I love it. Okay, let's let's go back and watch this. Okay, here we go. Pastor Jack Hibbs, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, Chino, California. <clears throat> let's pray. Almighty God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, Together we come before you in humility as a people in need of your forgiveness, your mercy, your goodness, and your grace. For these 250 so years, our fathers in this Congress have prayed for your guidance and protection. And so we stand here in humble petition that you today might do the same, that this nation and its unparalleled constitution your great gift to all freedom-loving people might be renewed here and across this land as a beacon of hope to all who seek peace. I ask you today, Father, to bring to us a great awakening of righteousness and confidence in you, who alone is mighty to save. Hear my cry in this hour of great need that we might be humbly blessed 
before you in the repentance of our national sins. You, Almighty God, are the source of all wisdom, and there is no wisdom but that which comes from you. So please come upon those here who are the stewards over the business of our nation with your wisdom, which comes from above, and with your holy fear, knowing that your coming day of judgment draws near when all who have been and are now in the authority will answer to you, the great judge of heaven and of earth, for the decisions that they make here in this place. I offer this prayer to you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Son, your Son, and our crucified Savior and resurrected Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> I just... What a fantastic prayer. And I got to tell you, it's real. Jack believes every word of that prayer. It's a prayer of his own heart that him and Lisa have been praying forever. Jack's been praying prayers like that from before the time I ever got involved in ministry over 30 years ago. I'm just going to tell you right now, I am super proud of what he did, he represents guys like me. He represents people like you. He represents those of us that are fighting in the ministry tooth and nail every single day. What an absolutely astounding prayer. And you know what I love most about that prayer? God heard Jack in the halls of the United States Congress. I got to tell you that right now. In the House of Representatives, God was listening to the voice of Jack Hibbs, and that makes me so proud. That makes me so happy. So now that I have rejoiced in what was an absolutely amazing prayer, I want to cut in an interview for you guys to watch that Jack did where he actually talks about what happened because he was staunchly opposed. He was opposed by many members in the house. And I, we're going to talk about this. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you the letter that was actually written because the letter that was written is disgusting. And if you don't like me offering commentary and interrupting as I read certain things, you're not going to like this video because I'm going to tear this letter apart to pieces. And I'm going to show you guys how important it is for you to stand on the truth and stand on the facts. These people are traitors to our country. These people are absolute turncoats. They do not love Americans. They do not love you. They do not love our country. And I promise you, all they want to do is see it be further destroyed. These are the same people that are destroying your libraries. They're the same people that are destroying your schools. They're the same people that are destroying the world that you live in right now. And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to bring it all out in the open. I'm going to show you this because this letter is an embarrassment. This letter needs to be read every single time these guys claim to stand up for anybody's freedom because it's one of the most intolerant, bigoted, satanically inspired pieces of writing I have seen in a very long time. And we're going to go over it shortly. But look at Jack's reaction to this. Um, and I thought this was really, really, really well done. He's out of state right now. Otherwise, I'd have got him on the show talking about this himself. But look at what he says because this is a very, very important reaction. And I absolutely love what he says here. And this is um, uh, really, really important to watch. We're not exactly sure when these rules came into effect, but at some point in time, if you're going to pray in Congress, which according to Benjamin Franklin and our founding fathers, that's how we are to open up our government. A lot of people forget about that, that there's yeah. supposed to be a separation of church and state. Well, our founding fathers said we're not going to start the business of the nation without prayer. And so Amazing. that happens continually. People don't realize that. And so I was blessed and honored that uh, House... By the way, I, I want to stop uh, really quickly because I do need to say this. Separation of church and state is not even a constitutional term, okay? This is really, really important. This was a term by one of our founding fathers while they were writing a letter to the Danbury Baptist Association regarding a concern that they had over the fact that he was part of a different religious denomination and thought that by him being in power, there would be a potential problem with the other denomination being interfered with. And when it was um, being addressed, you need to understand that Jefferson made it very clear that there would not be an, any interference and the term separation of church and state or church and state was a term that was actually used in that letter. 
And I'll read that to you in just a second. I'll read that portion of the Danbury Baptist Association letter as soon as Pastor Jack is done, because it is really important to go over. We're going to kind of defeat that issue, but we will talk about that in just a second. Speaker Mike Johnson invited me to come in and to open up Congress in prayer. And uh, yet there are existing rules that say, for example, you can't, have, you can't have a prayer more than 150 words. You're, <laughs> you're, you're to avoid father, offend some people. You can't bring up Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior what? because that's proselytizing. So I put together in a hurry, this is kind of embarrassing to reveal on TV, but <laughs> I put my prayer together quickly and sent it off. And then as uh, I got close to heading into DC uh, in LA, getting ready to go, um, I just reviewed my prayer again and I realized um, I just had to ask God, I'm sorry for this prayer. Mm. Yeah. And so I just, I rewrote it right then and there and put it in my pocket. And so went to Congress, had it there with me, prayed that prayer. And uh, apparently the first sentence uh, caused the atheist to get all excited. I opened that prayer by saying, Father, we thank you for our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ, <laughs> our, and, and just the first sentence got atheists upset, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. Because if you're an atheist, why should you be upset at a prayer? Yeah, isn't that funny? Like, I, I have never understood why somebody who calls himself an atheist spends so much of their energy being angry at a God that they say doesn't exist. What a complete ridiculous. I mean, it's just ridiculous, but that's a whole other issue. Uh, and this is the freedom of religion or freedom from religion uh, knucklehead that got upset, but that's a whole other story. And we'll actually get into it a little bit. We'll, we'll talk about this a little bit. Uh, but then they countered back by saying, you know, the separation of church and state. Well, I didn't ask to be there. <laughs> Right. The government asked me to come and pray. So it just goes, you know, it goes with the days of deception mm -hmm. where people will express their worldview without God and they expect you to roll over and play dead. But if you know history, if you know your Bible, and if you certainly know what is referred to as American exceptionalism is that this nation was founded like no other. Yeah. And so when you know those things, then you stand firm in that because it's true. And um, I just refuse to be intimidated. I refuse to be uh, canceled. I just, I just won't do that. And so I spoke the truth. The amazing thing, you guys, is that when the prayer was over, I stepped off uh, the podium there in, co in Congress, and I was overwhelmed with greetings from congressmen and the chaplain. The chaplain said, thank you so much for praying that prayer. Because, again, this is some existing rule that um, I think it was the Lord that had me Absolutely. have some divine disobedience, if that works. I like that. It was. Darn straight. Divine disobedience. I absolutely love that. I think it's great. And I love what Jack had to say. And so um, we're going to get into this a little bit. The first thing I want to address is the discussion of separation of church and state. Then the other thing we're going to do is we are going to look at this letter. And we're going to show this letter to you as I read it. Uh, this letter that the United States Congress sent to Mike Johnson and, of course, the chaplain of the, um, of the House of Representatives. And I'm going to just tell you this right now. It's a disgusting letter. We're going to go over it, and then we're going to actually go a little bit over some of the media attention that this got. And then um, I am going to show you how for so many years after the founding of our nation and through the process of the founding of our nation, our forefathers not only prayed, but they prayed to God Almighty in many different situations, from declaring fasts to uh, seeking the Lord for help to thanking him when they were successful. Folks, I'm going to show you some things that are going to blow your mind. By the way, thanks to my friend William Federer. He's the one that really gets the credit for all of the historical work that I'm going to bring to you. But I'm going to just say this right now, and I think it's really, really, really important we have to kick the door open to reveal where the lies sit. And we are going to do just that. So let's start with the letter to the Danbury Baptist Association, because that's an important one. And I'll read to you where the term separation of church and state came from, and then we'll go from there. So a little bit of history with respect to this letter. This is a letter that was given to Thomas Jefferson, while he is president, by the Danbury Baptist Association, 
And um, there's a lot of complexities that get argued over with respect to the issues that surround a letter. And what's relevant for the discussion that we're having right now is to read the portion of Thomas Jefferson's response to uh, this committee, uh, to some of the other people uh, that were involved in writing this, okay? So this is kind of important. And um, Thomas Jefferson's response is very simple, and this is where we get the term separation of church and state. Since this letter has been written, there's been a lot of abuse and a lot of misunderstanding and certainly misappropriation of this term because nowhere do you see this in the First Amendment, right? There's nowhere where you see this there. And it's really important that we point that out. But let me read the appropriate portion of the letter that he responds to. Uh, and uh, we'll just read the second paragraph here of that letter. And it is really important to understand what he says. It says, Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other than his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people, which declared that their legislature should make, here it is, this is, uh, he's quoting again the Constitution, no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We call this the Establishment Clause of the Constitution, which is the First Amendment, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. Adhering to this expression of the supreme will of the nation in behalf of the rights of conscience, I shall see with sincere satisfaction the progress of those sentiments which tend to restore to man all his natural rights, convinced he has no natural right in opposition to his social duties. And he goes on to say this, I reciprocate your kind prayers for the protection and blessing of the common father and creator of man and tender you uh, for yourselves and your religious association assurances of my high respect and esteem. So, I want you to understand that what is in essence being said here is that Jefferson is reiterating the principle that was given to us by our founding fathers that the government of the United States of America absolutely will not interfere in man's right to be able to worship him. And that extends to their ability to be able to share their expression of worship to the true and living God within the context of their government responsibilities. This is why they prayed on a regular basis, and this is why they did the things that they did. The idea of the Establishment Clause was to keep the government from telling people what they can or cannot do as it relates to their decision to worship God. And if that meant that there are people who choose to worship God solemnly as a process involved in how they legislate or how they actually rule, then the government has no right to interfere with it. In other words, if somebody wants to pray before they start doing the work of the government, the government can't say anything about it. It is their freedom to be able to do so. And when we stop for a second to talk about this, you have to understand there is nothing in the Constitution that prohibits this. Now, we're going to get into this a little bit more because when you start to examine what our forefathers did, especially with the subject of prayer, it will change the way that you actually look at what's actually happening with these people that are doing what they're doing. So, Let's start with this article from the Gateway Pundit, and you can actually see the title. It says, Dems Enraged by Christian Pastor House Invocation. And it's an interesting article. I would highly recommend that you read it. It says this. It says, a coalition of Democrats in the U.S. House, led by self-proclaimed atheist uh, Representative Jared Huffman, has written to Speaker Mike Johnson to express members' rage over a Christian pastor's recent house invocation and to express their intolerance for his views. Yes, folks, that's what we're talking about here. They are distinctly annotating in the written record of our government that they do not tolerate the views of our uh, dear brother, Pastor Jack Hibbs. Let's continue on with the article. It says, it was Pastor Jack Hibbs of Calvary Chapel 
in Chino Hills who had been invited to deliver the invocation and as a Christian spoke of a coming day of judgment, right? <laughs> and they didn't like that. Look at what the Democrats say. They responded by claiming Hibbs is a radical Christian nationalist who helped fuel the January 6th insurrection and who has a long record of hateful vitriol toward non-Christians, immigrants, and members of the LGBTQ community. By the way, I want to just make myself clear. Nothing could be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, in my opinion, I think the most hateful people right now that are in government are the Democrats. They are, by every stretch of the imagination, some of the most intolerant, some of the most hateful, some of the most vitriolic, some of the most nefarious liars that continue to function according to the will of their father, Satan, in what they do. They're hateful in that they manage to kill babies. They're hateful in the fact that they manage to continue to hate the black race by the things that they continue to stand supposedly for. They continue to demonstrate their hatred for the God of their fathers that gave them the freedom that they had and they hate the United States of America, and they make that very, very clear. They go on to continue to separate the nation by their lies in the name of something that they appear to be honorable or correct, but in reality, these are absolutely wicked and demonically inspired people. Let me read the letter to you, and I want to warn you, it is uh, very, very, very angering, especially if you know the truth, and it is absolutely ugly, but this is what the letter says. The letter says, and you can follow along, we're putting it on the screen. The letter says, Dear Speaker Johnson and Chaplain Gibeon, the undersigned members write to express our concerns about Speaker Johnson's sponsorship of Pastor Jack Hibbs as the guest chaplain of the House of Representatives. Pastor Hibbs is a radical Christian nationalist who helped fuel the January 6th insurrection and has a long record of spewing hateful vitriol toward non-Christians, immigrants, and members of the LGBTQ community. He should never have been granted the right to deliver the house openings, uh, the House's opening prayer on January 30th, 2024. I'm going to just make myself very clear because I know Jack. I know Jack personally. I've known Jack personally for almost the whole time that I've been in ministry. He's been my friend the whole time. And I can tell you right this right now, Jack is a, not a hateful man. He never has been a hateful man. And I want to make myself very clear when I say this. I have watched Jack on his knees crying to the God of heaven to have mercy upon the lives of people who are lost. He has prayed and reached out to the LGBTQ community. He has prayed and reached out to the people who absolutely hate God and have hated him. He has a huge heart for immigration and for immigrants. And the reason why he has always stood up for the principles that he stood up for is because he hates watching them be exploited. He knows that with respect to the LGBTQ stuff that's going on right now, he knows that there are are no answers to the promises of the sexual revolution. The, those promises come up empty, which is why he fights for them. And he fights for them by telling them the truth. This is the reason why he speaks so boldly against immigration, uh, illegal immigration, because he knows that when illegal immigration takes place, drugs come into the country that exploit innocent children. Children get separated from their parents. He knows that with illegal immigration, terrorist actions continue to increase. He knows that with illegal immigration, we begin to see people's families fall apart because in reality, the, 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 the inundation of the type of uh, unstructuralizing of society as we know it begins to take place. And the greatest victims of illegal immigration are those coming across the border that mean the best for them and their families. They're the ones that get exploited by the criminals. And the reality of it is, Pastor Jack has always fought to defend these people. Look what they go on to say. In the days leading to the attack on the Capitol, Hibbs echoed Donald Trump's election fraud lies and inflamed his followers by preaching that January 6th could go down in history alongside the War of Independence and the War of 1812, by preaching that God had anointed the Trump administration and could still intercede to save Trump's presidency on January 6th. Hibbs advanced a religious permission structure. It's so ridiculous. What a bunch of crap. Forgive me for saying that. What a bunch of garbage. A religious permission structure that led to violence by those who believed any means were justified to carry out what they viewed as God's plan. On January 6th, Hibbs attended the MAGA rally 
at the ellipse that preceded the attack, immediately after sacking of the Capitol, he went on Tony Perkins' Washington Watch program to tacitly justify what had just happened by repeating the lie that the election was manipulated and claiming this is what you get when you eject God from the courts and from the schools and teach children their evolutionary byproducts. Okay, I want to make myself very, very clear. Jack never encouraged any insidious behavior. He never encouraged any behavior that would uh, cause anybody to go and do damage in the Capitol. Jack has never encouraged anything like that. The only principle that Jack was concerned with was the truth, and he continues to be concerned with the truth. And all of us want to make sure that integrity sits in every aspect of the life that we live, especially as it relates to selecting our leaders. So the fact that Jack was uh, uh, out there speaking up does not make him a criminal, it doesn't make him a terrorist, and it certainly does not make him complicit in the idea that the Capitol was, uh, uh, what happened in the Capitol actually happened. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of questions about what really happened in the Capitol as we're beginning to see with some of the video that's come out. So I just want to make myself very, very clear. Pastor Jack is not the man that these people are characterizing him out to be. He is an honorable, godly man that did exactly what anybody in his position should have done. It was a very, very important thing for him to take the stand that he took, and he is not responsible for the inflammatory behavior that in many cases was actually caused by the enemy of our souls, Satan, who were inspiring the hearts of people like Antifa and the Democrats. I want to make myself very, very clear here. This is the truth, and we need to speak the truth. Look at what it goes on to say. As if spreading election lies and providing religious support and cover for the January 6th insurrection was not enough to disqualify Hibbs from being a guest chaplain, Hibbs also has a hateful and divisive public record on civil and human rights. What an outright lie. Pastor Jack has been involved in saving more lives before some of these Congress people were even adults. They're still not acting like adults. They're like kids coming to the table that don't know their heads from their rears. I'm sorry, Elhan Omar. You don't even know what safety even is. You, you want Sharia law, the same law that would actually destroy your life. You have no idea what you're talking about. These people are absolutely crazy. Pastor Jack was defending the lives of all of these people that they're talking about before Elhan Omar was a thought in her father or mother's mind. So let's get real about what's really happening here. Let's tell the truth. Let's not rewrite history. Liars. When his opening prayer invoked holy fear and repentance for national sins, these were allusions to the militant and fanatical agenda he preaches about the LGBTQ plus community, Jews, Muslims, and anyone who conflicts with his biblical worldview. Nothing could be further from the truth, you liars. Nothing could be further from the truth. Do not represent the Jews that you hate. Do not represent, in essence, the principles of our culture that you also hate. And do not claim to represent the truth because you're all liars. None of you are telling you the truth. You are complete manipulators. And that's exactly what they're good at doing. Among other things, he has called transgender people a sexually perverted cult who are in violation of the word and will of God and part of an anti-God, anti-Christ plan of none other than Satan himself. He launched a nationwide campaign to require schools to out transgender students in order to defeat demonic and dark satanic powers. Okay, first of all, their characterization of what Jack has been seeking to do in schools has nothing to do with targeting individuals who are confused about their sex. Everything that he has been targeting in schools is keeping the schools from exploiting our children to pornographic material that continues to pervert their minds. And yes, it's satanic. And yes, it's wicked. And yes, it's demonic. And yes, it is completely 100% bankrolled by the devil himself. Okay? I'm sorry, but that's the truth. And the problem is every pastor that's out there should stand up for this against this letter. Every single pastor out there should not let these people get away with the lies that they're telling because they are exploiters. Let me tell you something, folks. They hate your children. 
They hate your children. They don't care about your children. How do I know they hate your children? Because they tried to kill your children before they left their mother's womb. Make no mistake about it. They hate them. It's very important that I point that out, okay? He claims, they go on to say this, he claims that same-sex marriage has crucified God's word and that homosexuality and acceptance of LGBTQ plus people is evidence that humanity is living in the last days. And I'm going to just make myself very, very clear, okay? First of all, the lifestyle of homosexuality is unbiblical. The Bible makes that very, very clear, okay? Jack has always loved those who sin, but hates the sin itself because the sin itself destroys the lives of the people who capitulate to it. So I will stand by Jack and tell you that all of this serves as evidence of the fact that we are in the last days. Make no mistake about it. If they look at Jack this way, how in the world are they going to look at me? Are you kidding me? I'm a lot more aggressive in my terminology with respect to all of this. He champions discredited conversation therapy and has railed opposition to California law to reduce anti-LGBTQ plus bullying in schools. Okay, what they continue to say is he comes against the idea that you should sit down with somebody who's confused and walk them through the truth and help them through the difficulty they're going through. That's how evil these people are. These people actually think it's a literal crime to try to convince somebody to think differently. That's how evil these individuals are. Hibbs' intolerance non-Christians is also breathtaking. He preaches that Christians are at war against the death cult of Islam, which he calls a vehicle for Satan in the last days. Okay, first of all, you ignorant, foolish people, not a single one of you understand what the tenets of the Quran are. You do not know what these people believe. Take it from a immigrant First generation into this country from Egyptian mother and father, I know exactly what the fundamentals of the Quran are. And if you are an Islamic fundamentalist, then you believe in the death of anybody who comes against Allah, be'isma Allah, in the name of Allah. So stop your lying people. You people are liars. But that's just the reality of it. He criticizes Christians who seek interfaith dialogue with Muslims based on a common Abrahamic origins of the two religions as falling for a demonic doctrine being propagated by heretics. Again, you take Jack's view completely out of context. Jack has never been against sitting down and having a dialogue with a Muslim about their view. Jack is against the embracing of the view of Islam as your own view if you yourself are a Christian when you know the truth and you understand that Islam's end is death. Let's just be real. Let's talk about the truth here. You know what really drives me nuts? Half the cowards that are participating in this letter would never be able to quote even five verses out of the Bible, and they wouldn't even be able to quote one verse out of the Quran. I'm just making myself very clear. This one is perhaps one of the most egregious paragraphs, right? At a time of rising anti-Semitism, Hibbs also disparages Jews as being in a stupor and in a God-given blindness, unlike the true Jews who worship Jesus because they didn't get bogged down in Judaism, which cannot save you. Okay, you guys are about as evil. As, I, look, I'm just saying this right now. You do not know Jack Hibbs, and you guys are liars. Jack is one of the most pro-Israeli, pro-Jew guys that I know. And most people will never know what Jack has done for the state of Israel. As a matter of fact, Jack has done more for the state of Israel than any of these death cult Democrats that are writing these letters. Remember, it's the action of these Democrats that are encouraging the behavior of Hamas right now in Gaza towards innocent Jews. It's these Democrats that are saying from the river to the sea. It's these Democrats that want Sharia law in the United States of America, specifically Elhan Omar and some of her accomplices. Let's get real. You have no idea what you're talking about. Jack loves Jews and he loves Arabs all alike. You're crazy to think anything else. You're nuts. You're lying is what you are. He also recently argued that the Israel-Hamas war is another sign of the end times and that Jewish people must save themselves by turning to Jesus. If they do, he urges Christians to look past the sins of Israel and the sins of the Jew and give them the hope of Jesus. What a crock of garbage. It's amazing how much they can take certain things out of context. The Bible talks to us 
about the Jews and how we are to regard them as God's ancestrally chosen people. And if we love the Jews, then we will tell them continually about what's available to them through their Messiah. We will tell them about the love that God has for them. We will stand with them. We will support them. And yes, we will come against the actions of Hamas. We will come against anti-Semitism at every level. This is ridiculous. I have been with Jack literally at a function with the state of Israel, watching him cry as he is saddened in his heart about what he watched, what we watched together, which was a video of a, a classified video of the murder of 139 of the uh, 1,300 Jews that were killed. And if you're like me and you could understand the Arabic that those people were saying while they were doing it, you would know. They were not freedom fighters. These people, make no mistake, were demon-possessed when they were doing what they were doing. You could see the demons in them. It's absolutely ridiculous. Hibbs also embraces the false and exclusionary Christian nationalist narrative that the United States was established as a Christian nation, and he has repeatedly flouted uh, separation of church and state by working to institutionalize Christian prayer and Bible readings at local school board meetings, among other things. Okay, uh, the, do you notice that these people, when they write their letters, make it look like a crime to actually state that our Christian has, I mean, that our nation has Christian values, that it was started based on Christian principles? These liars they don't want to admit that the very root of our nation's founding, the very root of our constitution, our governing documents, everything about our nation was founded in Christianity, founded in the Bible. Literally, all of the basis for all that we've done as a nation from its very inception was inspired by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. These people should be in a, 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 just ashamed of themselves. They are evil. They are absolutely evil people. In addition to all these reasons why him should never have led Congress in prayer, the decision to allow him to be a guest chaplain makes a mockery of the basic guest chaplain instructions for member offices. Hibbs is not from the district of Speaker Johnson, i.e. the sponsoring member. Speaker Johnson did not deliver a welcoming speech. The prayer was not delivered on the last legislative day of the week. And Hibbs was Speaker Johnson's second sponsored guest chaplain in the span of just a couple of months, even though members are limited to one request per Congress. Moreover, in light of Hibbs' radical and divisive record, no reasonable person should view his invocation uh, sectarian references to holy fear, repentance, and national sins as meeting the chaplain's stated expectations for prayer that is mindful of diversity, transcends petty differences, and expresses a common aspiration to just and peaceful society. Okay, let me get into this for a second. Express a common aspiration to just and peaceful society. In order to have peace, does that mean absence of confrontation? You will never have peace if there's absence of confrontation. Transcendent of petty differences. The nation sitting against the God that founded that nation is not a petty difference. The idea that you hate the God of your fathers is not a petty difference. Do you call it a petty difference when you want to kill my child? When my child is in their mother's womb? Is that a petty difference? Is it a petty difference that you want to sexualize my children in the schools? Is it a petty difference that you want to continue to lead this nation through a process of sinful action that it reflects that of the reprobate heart read in Romans chapter one? None of those are petty differences. You're out of your dang minds. You're absolutely crazy. This is ridiculous. Look at what they go on to say. This letter gets more and more egregious. It says a decision by the speaker and house chaplain to welcome Pastor Hibbs is especially galling in light of the chaplaincy's refusal to allow some signers of this letter to sponsor guest chaplains who meet all the stated expectations of the program. Yeah, you're, you're, you're perverted, twisted, doctored up, lied filled against the heart of our country expectations. It's just absolutely ridiculous, right? We should all be able to agree that the guest chaplain program should not be used as a political tool, nor should it be implemented in a way that favors one religion over others or applies inappropriate religious tests. What a ridiculous pile of crap. If they, if they had an, a, a Muslim up there 
that was getting up and saying, Muhammad Rasulullah, and beginning to do the Islamic prayers, they wouldn't blink. They've had that done before. No one says anything. By the way, praying the same prayers that the 9-11 terrorists were screaming when they were flying the planes into the tower. Standing on Capitol Hill and saying, while they're flying the planes into the tower, they were saying the same things. And you see that more appropriate than Jack saying, God, forgive us. We've sinned against you. Have mercy on us. Make our nation great. We know that it starts with our repentance. It's absolutely insane. For all these reasons, we request a complete explanation of the process by which Pastor Hibbs was recommended, vetted, and approved, including the reason why the chaplain waived basic requirements of the guest chaplain program for Hibbs of all people. Please also describe the steps you will take in the future to prevent someone with a hateful and divisive record from delivering the opening prayer and to ensure that people of all faiths and values are equitably represented as guest chaplains. Finally, please explain why the chaplaincy has continued to prevent members from sponsoring certain fully qualified guest chaplains, such as Representative Mark Pokin's constituent, non-theistic chaplain Dan Barker. Okay, let me, can I just say this? This is a basically a guy who is, uh, he, he, doesn't, he, he doesn't believe that God exists, yet he spends a lot of time uh, and a lot of energy in hating the God that he says doesn't exist, that he wants to go up and do a prayer. Who are you praying to? Who are you praying to? You want a guy to go up there to pray to a God that he says doesn't exist? How ridiculous is that? And you people talk about having tolerance for somebody's religious view, and you look at Jack's sincere commitment to Christ, and you call it hateful. Folks, I want to warn you about something. These people want to destroy your freedom. They want to destroy your life. They want to destroy your religious freedom. We hope to work with you in the spirit of uploading constitutional protections for religious freedom and pluralism and to ensure that the House reflects and respects our country's essential constitutional values and increasingly diverse faith perspectives. Thank you for your prompt attention to this matter. And look at the people that are signing this, right? Jared Huffman, Jamie Raskin, uh, Mark Polkin. And I'm going to mispronounce some of these names. And quite frankly, I really don't care. They don't even deserve to have their names pronounced correctly. Pramila J. Powell, Jan Shalowski, Sean Caston, Susan Wilde, Henry C. Hank Johnson. What is this? Uh, uh, Jared Nadler. My goodness. Jerry Nadler. What, what a traitor to his own people. What a traitor. Jerry Nadler is a joke. Mark Takano, Robert Garcia, Dan Goldman, Becca Balliant, Delia Ramirez, Katie Porter. Kevin Mullum, John Garamondi, Eleanor Holmes Norton, Ilhan Omar. Yes, of course, Ilhan Omar. We should expect that. She's the one that started running her mouth faster than anybody. She's a Muslim, by the way. It's interesting to think that, right? You would think that at least as a Muslim, she would accept the idea that there is one God and would believe that that God demand holiness. She's not holy. Ask her brother. Anyway, I'm not even going to get into that. Raul Reese, Barbara Lee. James McGovern, Rosa DeLauro, Julia Browley, Summer Lee, Gerald Connolly. Think about this nonsense. These are the people that have collectively signed in order to declare Jack a hateful person. I want to close with this idea. And this is where I really thank William Federer because I think William is, gosh, he's such a national treasure. I, I love what William Federer says. I'm going to read some of what he says. I think this is so cool. And William Federer brings out some things that are so important for us to pay attention to and I think mean a lot. It, it really helps us to understand what exists and what sort of happened in the early days of our founding. I love this. William Federer says this. He says, during the days of America's founding, colonies would declare, look at this, days of prayer when times were bad. Days of fasting when times were real bad and days of Thanksgiving when things turned around. This developed into many colonies like New Hampshire and Massachusetts having annual days of fasting often, ready for this guys, on Good Friday. There's a document here that we can show you. It's a, procl a proclamation for the annual fast. You can see it. It's, it's posted right here. 
So what you're reading right now, what, what I'm actually showing you is prime evidence of the fact that these colonists were not deists, as people would say, who believed God set laws of nature in place and then let everything run on its own. No, they believed in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they worshiped Christ, their Messiah. America's founders believed in a living relationship with God where if people sinned, he would call them to repent. If they did not repent, he would send judgment. And when they repented and believed, he would send deliverance, health, and blessings. They read the words of Deuteronomy. He talks about what happens, I think, in the, in the first either 16 or 18 verses or so. He talks about what would happen if the people would listen to the voice of God. And this is relevant because he's talking to Israel, but Israel was supposed to be a model to every nation in the world. So you hearken to, you obey the voice of God. Blessed will be you in the country. Blessed will be you in the city. You basically curse God. You disobey, you don't hearken. Then God will curse you. It says it. All these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Second Chronicles was another picture where God promised that if his own people who were called by his name would humble themselves and pray and seek their face and turn from their wicked ways, that he would hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and heal their land. This is when Israel was in the midst of a major drought. This is in the midst of the dedication of the temple. And God knew that if the people of God got right, then he would restore their land. And again, Israel is the shining light. It's the example for us. God wanted to show through Israel what would happen to all the other nations if they followed God or did not follow God. Look at this picture. This is the Pennsylvania Gazette. You can see this. During a threat of war, Ben Franklin published a proclamation of a general fast in the Pennsylvania Gazette. It's dated December the 12th, 1747. Look at what it says. The calamities of a bloody war seem every year more nearly to approach us. And there is just reason, notice this, to fear that unless we humble ourselves before the Lord and amend our ways, we may be chastised yet with heavier judgments. You can see it, it's right there. We have thought fit to appoint a day of fasting to join with one accord in the most humble and fervent supplications that Almighty God would mercifully interpose and still the rage of war among the nations and put a stop to the effusion of Christian blood. Do you guys think it's a coincidence, honestly, that we're in the midst of five wars? And in any one of these wars, there's over 21 nations involved in it that we meet the literal definition of a world war right now. And more than ever, the nation that was built upon the, 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 the foundation of Christ and his word is falling apart. Do you think there's a coincidence? You think it's a coincidence that we're being cursed at every level, including financially? It's because we've walked away from God. Think about this, folks. Look, take a moment to just look for one moment at Joe Biden. Joe Biden doesn't even remember his name. He is a great picture of God's judgment upon this country. God says, Joe Biden can't even remember his own name. God wants us to see that. Why? Because the United States of America forgot the name of God. And God says, you want to forget my name? You want to forget my word? I will show you a man that will rule you that doesn't even know his own name and leads the nation into destruction. It's heavy. Thomas Jefferson, look at this. You can see the first National Thanksgiving proclamation. Thomas Jefferson is a member of the House he says, drafted a day of fasting for Virginia in 1774 to be observed on the day British ships blockaded Boston's harbor. With apprehension from the hostile invasion of the city of Boston, whose commerce and harbor are to be stopped by an armed force, deem it highly necessary that the said first day of June be set apart by the members of this house as a day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer devoutly to implore divine interposition. Look at that. After the Declaration of Independence was proclaimed in July the 4th, 1776, the first National Day of Thanksgiving was declared by the Continental Congress. November the 1st, 1777, to celebrate British General Burgoyne surrendering over 6,000 soldiers at the Battle of Saratoga. 
The grateful feeling of their hearts joined the penitent confession of their manifold sins that it may please God through the merits of Jesus Christ mercifully to give and blot them out of remembrance and under the providence of Almighty God secure for these United States the greatest of all human blessings, independence, and peace. Folks, that is a quote. That is a quote from that national proclamation of thanksgiving. John Paul Jones commanded the Bonham Richard in a sea battle with the 50-gun British frigate HMS Serapis, in the midst of the fighting, the British commander yelled, asking if the Americans were ready to surrender. John Paul Jones shouted back, I have not yet begun to fight. When the British surrendered on September the 21st, 1779, the Continental Congress declared a, th a day of thanksgiving, recommending that the 13 states do likewise. Look at what Congress says. In accordance with the Virginia governor, Thomas Jefferson proclaimed for Virginia, November 11, 1779, this is what Congress says. Let me read the quote. It's powerful. Congress hath thought proper to recommend to the several states a day of public and solemn thanksgiving to Almighty God for his mercies and of prayer for the continuance of his favor that he would go forth with our hosts and crown our arms with victory, that he would grant to his church the plentiful effusions of divine grace and pour out his Holy Spirit on all ministers of the gospel, that he would bless and prosper the means of education and spread the light of Christian knowledge throughout the remotest corners of the earth. I do therefore issue this proclamation appointing a day of public and solemn thanksgiving and prayer to Almighty God given under by hand this 11th day of November in the year of our Lord, 1779. Thomas Jefferson. How about this? Think about this. Traitor Benedict Arnold planned to betray the West Point to the British on the exact day General Washington was scheduled to visit, ensuring his capture. And when the plot was thwarted, the Continental Congress proclaimed a day of Thanksgiving on October the 18th, 1780. This is what they say. In the late remarkable interposition of his watchful providence in the rescuing the person of our commander-in-chief and the army from imminent dangers at the moment when treason was ripened for execution, it is therefore recommended a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to confess our unworthiness and to offer our fervent supplication to the God of all grace to cause the knowledge of Christianity to spread all over the earth. Think about that, folks. All solemn day, days of thanksgiving. I could go on and on and on. Solemn day of Thanksgiving when British General Cornwallis centered at Yorktown. That day was proclaimed on October the 11th, 1782. Another day of proclamation of Thanksgiving was in October the 18th, 1783, after the Treaty of Paris was signed on September the 3rd, officially ending the Revolutionary War. It started by, in the name of the most holy and undivided Trinity. That's how it started. Think about that for a second. Think about the picture that that actually creates. Look at the, 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 the commitment that they had. Massachusetts governor, John Hancock. Yeah, the signer. Yes, that, that guy, John Hancock, who was a former president of the Continental Congress, proclaimed the day of Thanksgiving, November 8th, 1783. This is his quote. The citizens of these United States have every reason for praise and gratitude to the God of their salvation. I do appoint the 11th day of December uh, next, the day recommended by the Congress to all the states to be religiously observed as a day of thanksgiving and prayer that all people may then assemble to celebrate that he hath pleased to continue to us the light of the blessed gospel that we also offer fervent supplications to cause pure religion and virtue to flourish and to fill the world with his glory. You can see it. You can see the, the proclamation. We're showing you that on the screen. It's right there. This is funny. Look at this. The same week that Congress passed the Bill of Rights, which included the First Amendment, it requested President George Washington to issue a national day of thanksgiving to Almighty God. And this is what Washington wrote on October the 3rd, 1789. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have their joint committee requested me to recommend to people of the United States, a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now, therefore, I do recommend Thursday, the 26th day of November, to be devoted by the people of these United States to the service 
of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be, that we may then all unite rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for the peaceable and rational manner in which we have been enabled to establish constitutions of government, particularly the national one now lately instituted for the civil and religious liberty with which we are blessed to promote the knowledge and practice of true religion and virtue. Amazing when you think about all of this, folks. Think about the, the, the picture that this creates. And we can go on and on. There are more and more and more and more and more and more and more pictures that we can draw of all of these things. How about this? Abraham Lincoln. This is, this is an interesting story, right? Abraham Lincoln proclaimed the first annual National Day of Thanksgiving in Washington, D.C. on October the 3rd, 1863. He says, in the midst of a civil war of unequal magnitude and severity, I do therefore invite my fellow citizens in every part of the United States and also those who are at sea and those who are sojourning in foreign lands to set apart and observe the last Thursday of November next as a day of thanksgiving and praise to our beneficent Father who dwelleth in the heavens. And I recommend they do also with humble penitence for our national perseverance and disobedience, commend to his tender care all those who have become widows, orphans, mourners, and sufferers in the lamentable civil strife in which we are unavoidably engaged and fervently implore the interposition of the Almighty Hand to heal the wounds of the nation and to restore it as soon as it may be consistent with divine purposes to the full enjoyment of peace, harmony, tranquility, and union, in testimony whereof I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington in this third day of October in the year of our Lord, 1,863, and of the independence of the United States, the 88th. By the president, Abraham Lincoln, William H. Seward, Secretary of State. Think about that for a second, folks. Think about that. America was spared a global cholera pandemic as referenced in President Grover Cleveland's National Day of Thanksgiving and prayer proclamation. And he goes and he thanks the Lord, our Heavenly Father, the same Father that Jack Hibbs was praying to, right? The 100th anniversary of Washington's inauguration, President Benjamin Harrison issued a National Day of Prayers and Thanksgiving, April 4th, 1889. He talks about God's blessing on the government. He talks about a deep faithfulness for all of our blessings, a devout supplication to God. Th think about all of that. The representatives of the religious creeds, both Christian and Hebrew, have memorialized a government to designate an hour for prayer and thanksgiving on that day. Folks, in his National Day of Thanksgiving proclamation, October 29th, 1900, President William McKinley acknowledged the charitable help given to the city of Galveston after a hurricane. And the way that he praises the same God that Jack Hibbs is praising. Theodore Roosevelt. This one's, I'm going to read this one to you because this one's important. Theodore Roosevelt acknowledged how rare America is in his National Day of Praise and Thanksgiving proclamation. October 24th, 1903. During the last year, the Lord has dealt bountifully with us. It behooves us to not only rejoice greatly because of what has been given to us, but to accept it with a solemn sense of responsibility, realizing that under heaven it rests with us ourselves to show that we are worthy to use a right and thus been entrusted to our care. In no other place and at no other time has the experiment of government of the people, by the people, for the people been tried so vast a scale as here in our own country in the opening years of the 20th century. Failure would not be a dreadful thing for us, but a dreadful thing for all mankind because it would mean loss of hope and all who believe in the power and righteousness of liberty. Therefore, in thanking God for the mercies extended to us in the past, we beseech him that he may not withhold them in the future. Think about that for a second. President Franklin Roosevelt, look at this, had proclaimed the first National Bible Week in 1941. Since then, every session of Congress has designated Thanksgiving week as National Bible Week. That's no joke. The same Congress, by the way, or some members of the same Congress that has completely sook to lie and humiliate, lie on and humiliate Pastor Jack. On November the 28th, 2018, my representative, Mike Johnson from Louisiana, now he's under fire right now, 
stated in a special session in the U.S. House. I want to thank my colleague, Congressman Lambord, for organizing this special order recognizing the 77th annual National Bible Week in America. This is a declaration first made by President Franklin D. Roosevelt just weeks before the start of World War II. Folks, I just want to explain something. Even Donald Trump wrote in his Thanksgiving proclamation, November the 23rd, 2017. On Thanksgiving Day, as we have for nearly four centuries, Americans give thanks to Almighty God for our abundant blessings. We gather with people to love, to show gratitude for our freedom, for our friends and families, and for the prosperous nation we call home. In July 1620, more than 100 pilgrims boarded the Mayflower, fleeing religious persecution and seeking freedom and opportunity in a new and unfamiliar place. These dauntless souls arrived in Plymouth, Massachusetts in the freezing cold of December 1620. They were greeted by sickness and severe weather and quickly lost 46 of their fellow travelers. Look at how he ends this proclamation. As one people, we seek God's protection, guidance, and wisdom as we stand humbled by the abundance of our great nation and blessings of freedom, family, and faith. Now, therefore, I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Constitution and the laws of the United States, do hereby proclaim Thursday, November the 23rd, 2017, as a national day of Thanksgiving. I encourage all Americans to gather in homes and places of worship to offer a prayer of thanks to God for our many blessings. How about we take all of that that we just read and put it up against the disgusting, lying, treasonous letter that they wrote concerning Jack Hibbs? Folks, I'm going to just tell you this right now. This is ugly. This is truly ugly. Enough is enough, folks. We need to be done with this. Here's the deal. In Bible prophecy, the United States of America is inconsequential. It is not mentioned in Bible prophecy. Now, I think that there are two reasons why that could be the case. The first reason why that could be the case is simply because... Quite frankly, it becomes inconsequential by virtue of the fact that it continues to give itself to its insatiable, app insatiable appetite for sin, and we are where we are. This letter is evidence of it. The other way that I think it could happen is that such a radical spiritual awakening takes place in this country, and such a radical change happens that by virtue of the fact that we are vacated because of the rapture, we become in inconsequential. Folks, that's what I hope happens. More than ever, we need to be closer to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. More than ever, we need to speak up about the right to be able to do what Jack Hibbs did. More than ever, we need to make sure we don't vote evil people like this into office. And we need to show everybody, every human being, the love of Christ. And the way we show the love of Christ is by proclaiming the truth. What hurts them, what helps them. We need to be the people who are faithful to one another by being faithful to God first. Enough is enough, folks. Our nation is going in a very dark direction. We cannot allow it to happen. It's that simple. God bless you guys. I want to end this, by the way, by praying for Pastor Jack and people like him. There are many that are bold, that are standing up and are under very heavy fire. Father in heaven, I just thank you, Lord, for Pastor Jack. I thank you, Father, for the ministry and the call that you've given him, Lord. I thank you for the purpose that you've put in front of him, Father. I pray that in the name of Jesus, you would protect him, his wife, his church, his ministry. You would protect him from head to toe, bless him spiritually, emotionally, mentally, physically, financially. Protect him from the wickedness of these evil rulers, Lord. Remove these evil rulers by bringing in people who will rule righteously. Help us to have a repentant heart as a nation that we would see change take place for your glory. So Lord, we love you and we thank you. We look to you and we ask these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.